It's not calling you Josh Frydenberg, it's calling you Dosh Frydenberg. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit your control room. They're answers that only can come from Victoria, I'm afraid, because that's not my job. But I ain't spending any time, though, because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Well, g'day and welcome, listeners, once again to The Two Jacks, uh, where we discuss matters uh, national, Australian politics and media, and then then go around the world and look at matters unfolding as they are around the world. And joining me, as per usual, is Hong Kong Jack, all the way in Hong Kong. G'day, mate. G'day. And how are things in Hong Kong today, mate? Well, it's midsummer here, but we're having a relatively quiet typhoon season, and I put that down to the enormous number of Teslas on the road. Oh, well, there you go. There are a couple of nasty ones brewing, hurricanes, of course, brewing in the Caribbean and the Atlantic as we speak, in the Atlantic, I should say, uh, the first time two hurricanes have turned up uh, in the Atlantic in over 100 years in the month of August, Jack. So there you go. Um, Let's look at, uh, well, let's start off having a look at uh, the Queensland Premier, who seems to be in a bit of strife, Jack. Uh, Well, there seems to be a a growing feeling amongst some of her comrades um, that she has run her course um, and it's time for her to go, you know, preferably before October. I think um, their election's due mid-next year. It is, yeah. And um, and they're keen to push her on so that somebody else gets time to get uh, embedded in the process and, and, and give them a better chance of success next year. Always back self-interest when you're talking about parliamentarians. Um, they all want to be re-elected. Well, yes, they want to stay in government, don't they? And, I, and, and there is obviously a view from within the caucus, the state caucus, that uh, she is not the one to, to deliver that. There has been a a great deal of consternation about uh, uh, the uh, Queensland Labor government's approach to youth crime and uh, and basically breaching its own Human Rights Act in uh, allowing youth to be detained in adult prisons and lockups, Jack, for indefinite periods. How do you feel about that? I'm most uncomfortable. Yeah, um, uh, I think that good human rights practice is there for a reason. Um, I'd be calling, um, what's his name, Terry O'Gorman in for a chat and saying, are we on the wrong track here? Yeah, and and this has become uh, an issue. And, of course, the, uh, the LNP opposition is equally hard and it seems like they're trading on young children's or young people's lives, often offenders. Um, I saw a, an interview with the Queensland copper saying, no, look, uh, we're finding that a lot of young people would prefer to be in a lockup than at home. Uh, and you think, is that, is that really true? Um, is the home environment so bad that you prefer to be in a lockup? Not entirely sure about that. But that seems to, that, that would not be something that Palaszczuk is losing favour over. At the same time, I mean, she's being hard, hard on the uh, you know tough on crime sort of agenda. That I don't think that's losing her uh, any popularity. But there are other things. And what what are we talking about here, Jack? Is it's just it's just been in the job too long? There's a fair bit of that. Um, uh, uh, she's also developed a taste for going to VIP opening nights and. Um, uh, and popping off on expensive holidays with the new boyfriend, and that I think um, has bad look. optics in Queensland. Yeah. It's a terrible look, and of course, the um, uh, the uh, the new laws which breach their own human rights, uh, um, <coughs> their own human rights act, um, uh, was rushed through the parliament with what can only be described as indecent haste. A, uh, we have a one uh, or a monocameral, monocameral legislature in uh, uh, in Queensland, the only one, I believe, in the country. Yeah, they, they got rid of their upper house, I think, in uh, it was a Labor government in the late 60s, I think. Yeah, so you got no no body of review, and and so that legislation was was raced through the parliament, so Anastasia could go away on her European holiday. 
Uh, yes. Terrible, and, uh, terrible look, I would say. And it might be that uh, when she uh, returns to Brisbane, uh, she's given her marching orders by the party, Jack. It is possible, isn't it? I mean, she's won three elections. And, and, yeah. and not, not only that, um, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to how you think she fits in the sort of pantheon of uh, great Australian premiers, long-term ones. Um, she came to the job of being leader of the opposition um, after the Bly government was absolutely slaughtered by uh, uh, Campbell Newman's um, um, uh, Liberal uh, Party. Um, I think they they didn't have enough opposition MPs to officially be an opposition, uh, but he um, granted them the usual perks and money um, uh, just because he thought they needed an opposition. Um, well, Palaszczuk so, yeah, was a junior minister at the time when when yeah, when yeah. Newman was erect, uh, elected on a uh, on a massive landslide which they yeah. were able to flip around because, well, perhaps we were giving Labor and Palaszczuk a little bit too much credit there because Newman, Newman's government was an absolute basket case. Yeah, uh, but, she, but she, she came to power in, in dire circumstances for the Labor Party. She became leader in dire circumstances. Yes, I and she and, and yes, you can always be lucky with your opponent and the Newman government... Um, sort of imploded to a, to, a, to a fair degree and she led them back into uh, into government and kept them there over um, two more elections. So um, that makes her a pretty significant figure. And there's, one, there's, there's things that the long-term premiers have in common. Um, uh, you, know, you think of you know, Dan Andrews currently, McGowan uh, just retired New South Wales, but going back through history to Neville Rand, uh, Henry Bolte, Joe Bielke, Peterson, they all had the capacity to bully the local media and they were all blessed with a poor opposition. Yeah, look, I <clears throat> having having spoken to a few, fair few uh, Queensland political watchers in recent times, the view about Palaszczuk, for good or real, is that she was a mediocrity uh, who who basically became premier when Newman failed. Now, um, she's uh, that that's that's probably a pretty broad sort of condemnation, um, but the. Uh, the evisceration of, of the Bly government meant that there was very, 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 very little talent left. She was really the only senior minister. She was junior minister at the time, so she she got the she got the leadership by default. She almost won the next election by default. But as you say, she's been able to in, well it has increased her margins both times. But she did increase her margin in the in her uh, when she was re-elected on the first occasion. Um, I'm not convinced that she's a, that she's one of the great premiers. She doesn't sit in that pantheon, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think she just she might just got a little bit lucky, Jack, uh, and her luck's running out. Well, that can happen in politics. Speaking of luck, Jack, uh, yeah, we'll keep uh, we'll keep our listeners updated on uh, matters Queensland. It may well be that there is a spill. I. I, I I get the strong sense that there will be. Uh, the Victorian Labor Party has found no one responsible for multiple forgeries behind the renewal of two dead men's memberships in the Lily D'Ambrosio linked branch uh, north of uh, Melbourne, one of the northern suburbs of Melbourne, with the son of one of the men saying he will now consider going to the police, Jack. Um, What's going to well, happen uh, there? Uh, not much. They'll give him a cup of tea and have listened to him, but there's not much they can do, I don't <laughs> think. Um, so it is. The, prima facie is forgery, isn't it? I mean, yeah. people signing names for people on on uh, that, that 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 have not been appraised for membership, and, and and in fact, in this case, were actually deceased, uh, signing them up for membership, cash only, and uh, and popping their signatures in. Mm. Well, it's certainly dodgy. Uh, I don't think the police investigation will go very far. Um, I noticed um, uh, in a classic bit of. Uh, uh, good political management. John Thwaites, a, a, a good fellow um, uh, and former state government minister, I think he did the inquiry um, and it was released late on a Friday um, uh, to avoid, uh, to minimise the uh, uh, 
Um, uh, yeah, you drop them. You drop them about five thirty, and uh, the new services just haven't got time to pick them up. Just, just as the just as the football's kicking off, I think is the is the answer. Oh, even that late. Yeah. So they uh, they miss the ABC news. Yes, uh, look, uh, we'll keep you abreast of that too. But it is part of what we might call the industrial scale branch stacking on both sides of uh, politics in Victoria. I mean, you and I might be members, Jack, we don't know about it. I hope we're yeah. members of the Labor Party, that would yeah. at least be suitable, but um, um, but we might end up uh, finding ourselves uh, in the Liberal Party, Jack. Well, it's um, uh, uh, people with our surname are fairly unusual, although not unknown in the Liberal Party. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a disease among the main major parties. And both major parties won't do anything about it. And, and it, the disease spreads because people become disillusioned with the major parties and you only got to look at their primary votes over the last 20 or 30 years uh, and uh, you would think that these sorts of practices contribute substantially to it. Well, it, it happens because the rewards for getting the numbers uh, in terms of pre-selection uh, and it, um, uh, in particular are great. Um, and when the rewards are great, people will bend the rules to achieve the, the result they want. Well, speaking of uh, that sort of thing, Susan Lay um, uh, was up for pre-selection. She was going to be challenged for pre-selection and the New South Wales Liberal Party State Council said uh, there will be no pre-selection. She's um, she's the member for the area around. Um, uh, uh, oh, I can't our, think of it. I can't think of it, it. But it spreads it, out uh, it, in it, the New it's South Wales. Yeah, yeah it, from, it, from Albury out, out past Griffith and Miranda away. Yeah, I think there's still a. I think there's a plaque on the on the footpath there for where I was born in Albury, but you know. No, oh, you think so? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there was. Yeah, yeah, yeah they would probably keep it really polished. Yeah. Nice and clean, but yes, yeah, Susan Lay and there are a number of other senior liberals who won't face won't face pre-selection regardless of their performance. And I'd have to say Susan Lay's performance in opposition has been pretty ordinary. Um, yeah, she, um, this uh, th- this happens from time to time in political parties when they when central office loses trust in the local membership and. Um, um, I can recall ha- recall it happening in Victoria and Labor a couple of times well, in the past. Well, Morrison pulled it in 2019 and then mm. did it again last year where there were essentially mm. no pre-selections mm. uh, in the state of New South Wales. So the, 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 the grassroots of the party has just been completely overlooked. Yeah, uh, and there are reasons for that. Um, in some ways, the grassroots of the party, as they've shrunk, the grassroots have reflected the members, not the, not the supporters of the party, the membership. The paid membership has shrunk away um, and um, no longer reflects so well the broad um, uh, the broad interests of the party support. There's probably an argument for making it easier to vote in uh, in pre-selections, more along the lines of the U.S. primary system, so that. Um, uh, it goes back to representing all Labor members, not just the people who pay the membership. Well, yes, if we're getting to Palace, but just, just to get back to Palace, eh, there we have a strong dominance of the left faction there, uh, mm. and they'll be the ones that move against her. We have a strong dominance of the left in um, uh, in Victoria, in the Labor government there, the Andrews government. Uh, we would call the Minns government more of a, more of a right a right ascendant uh, um, uh, government in terms of its factional or f- uh, who, who, who's running the show in terms of its factions? Well, um, well the, the New South Wales Party has always been a more centre-right party than a, um, than a, 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 a Victorian Socialist Left party. But even within the Victorian Socialist Left, um, it's, um, a lot of these alliances are kind of tribal uh, rather than ideological. Right. All right. <laughs> now, when we get to the referendum, I believe we'll find out the date today. Um, I did advise uh, our listeners a little earlier that, um, that October, I think October 14 was the date, but it hadn't been fixed yet. It's the likely date, and Albo will announce it this week. Um, been a bit of a well, funeral. The story, the story I read was he's going to announce this at a yes 
campaign function in Adelaide tomorrow. And I thought that was a bit odd that um, uh, it falls to the Prime Minister, I suppose, to announce the date. I just didn't think it was all that appropriate to do it at a kind of what's a campaign launch. Fair enough. Now, um, we've got this argument over ticks and crosses, Jack, which is just absolute nonsense uh, put about by the the no vote, that, that ticks will be counted as a yes, but crosses will not be counted as a no. But this has been uh, the rules of our referenda since 1988. Yeah, I believe so. David Spears had something to say about this at the end of Insiders, and he was talking about he showed... Peter Dutton's um, a declaration of interest. And he says, well, Peter Dutton used a cross when he meant yes on that. Um, and then he put that up on the screen. Unfortunately for David Spears, what that showed was that Peter Dutton had a choice of two boxes, a yes box and a no box, and he put a cross in the yes box. What the referendum's proposing is a single box where you write yes or no, and the Australian Electoral Commission is saying that's okay. If you put a tick in that box, it's a yes. If you put a cross, it's a no. Now, that's proving to be um, uh, controversial. I don't think this matters at all because I don't think the, 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 the I, I just can't see that the yes vote is going to get close enough that this sort of argument is going to well, matter at all. Well, what but, it tells me is the no, the no, the no vote or the no campaign. I mean, they're whinging and whining, and they, and they were actually in the business of saying that you know the system was against us. Uh, all this kind of persecution mentality was 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 around uh, was around the no vote, and it was just plainly nonsense. It was plainly nonsense. These are the rules that we have had now for uh, let me see, twelve, uh, thirty five years. years. Thirty five years. I, I, I might say that there is a there is an argument that in the days of the internet, uh, you might use two boxes rather than one, and you mark one box for yes or the other box for no, because that's what we're used to on on most forms well, these can days. Can you imagine the hue and cry from the no from the no folk if if we actually had a change to the voting system? Um, I mean, again, they'd be screaming blue murder uh, as well. So, listeners, when you get your opportunity, you either write the word yes or the word no. I think most Australians are pretty smart about how they vote. We've got very, but we've got compulsory voting, compulsory voting in referenda, of course, and uh, and we still look at a very small number of informal votes. Um, yeah, yeah, generally but, but, speaking, by elections change a bit. The, the yes, the That's yes vote isn't going to yes vote isn't going to get anywhere near enough to a win to make this effective. We shall see. It's still a long way off, Jack. Uh, haven't uh, no uh, no pencil or pen has hit the ballot yet. So uh, has it hit the ballot paper yet, uh, or the referenda paper yet? So we'll see how we get. Uh, are on we going to have early voting in this? Good question. Don't know. Um, uh, there won't. Uh, I imagine so. Um, uh, I will, I'll have a bit of a look at that. Obviously, we will need the date to be announced, but I would imagine that there would be early voting up to you know, a fortnight beforehand, uh, a la our federal and state elections in recent times. Can I just give you a quick uh, a note on how badly I think the Yes campaign is going, is that they uh, made Alan Joyce and Qantas a centrepiece of the Yes campaign just 10 days ago, um, uh, and... And, and yesterday, uh, Alan Joyce, oh, terrible performance um, uh, in Canberra um, uh, answering questions. And y you just think, why would you yoke your campaign to such an unpopular person as Alan Joyce and an unpopular airline as Qantas? Can't see it. Yeah, flew with them just last week. Not too bad. I'm not a fan of Joyce myself. And, of course, Tony Sheldon. Uh, Former uh, transport uh, TWU uh, secretary, now in the now in the parliament, absolutely the tore Senate, strips yeah. off him yesterday. Uh, could, could, <laughs> could, could we can we have a GoFundMe to buy Tony Sheldon a suit? <laughs> it does look a bit rough, doesn't it? I mean, that's that you know that's that sort of thing. You know, I'm going to wear an uh, wear an open neck shirt and so forth. He's a rebel. Yeah, do you, being do you a remember, rebel, do, and that do, sort of rebelliousness is silly in my view. Do, do you remember Pete Stephen? 
Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Pete, Pete was a lovely fellow. Really enjoyed his company, but he affected the leather jacket while he was in Parliament for yeah. some time, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, he was... He was a good deal older than me, but he was still masquerading as a sort of a mid-30s um, sort of semi-rock star when I knew him, which was, uh, given his yeah, it's, given it's, his age, was a It's really an affect. It's an affectation. It reminds me a little bit of... Uh, but he was I'm, excellent company, I've got to tell you, after over a long lunch. Uh, no. um, when uh, when, uh, when the, the long room at the MCC, the Melbourne Cricket Club, uh, started allowing women, this is going back to the Kane government uh, time when uh, John Kane said that's enough of this uh, sexist uh, membership behaviour. Through the So the MCC were obliged to throw... Uh, throw the long room open to women and uh, they'd had this long contrived um, dress code for men. Uh, you could wear <laughs> you could wear a tie or a cravat, but you had to wear one or the other. All this sort of nonsense. And when they got to women, these crusty old men didn't know what to do, so they just said no leather. Mm, that yeah, was it. Yeah. That was the only yeah. thing for the women. No leather. If you remember, John Kane uh, came up against a bit of opposition from the Victorian Racing Club and from the MCC because the Victorian Racing Club at Flemington, there were white lines painted um, uh, in various areas <laughs> of the uh, the place beyond which uh, women really were not allowed awful. to step. Uh, uh, and, and and there were old blokes in green coats who would who would prevent them from so the doing. quarter commissioners at the MCC, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and 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 John Kane had a little chat to them and says, "Well, look, you do understand that you you're both on crown land, um, uh, and and if you want to stay on crown land, uh, you're going to have to meet our standards." And lo and behold, both of the clubs quickly discovered the benefits of having women members. And no leather. No leather for no the leather. women. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a little bit now about immigration, which is your speciality, Jack, um, uh, and a couple of elements of it that uh, might be uh, might be open to rorting. Student visas. Now, obviously, this is very important for the Australian economy. We've got uh, uh, an education industry that's, uh, I think, our... I think it's uh, our, our second or third biggest export. Yeah, one um, of the two. Yeah, um, student visas, Jack. Um, the government has announced a range of measures to address rotting in the student visa system. And this was not surprising, given reports on student visa rotting, including in the unreleased Nixon review, that have become deafening. Uh, last year, the Department of Home Affairs made public warnings about the level of fraud it was seeing in student visa applications. As a result, there was a major increase in offshore student visa refusal rates. Um, what's going on there, Jack, and how do we fix it? Uh, well, this is a when there are considerable benefits attached to government decisions, um, there are always unscrupulous people who will hang around the industry and look for the loophole, look for the little gap in the business that they can make money in. Um, and that certainly happened with the student visas. Um, uh, some of the courses these people um, were enrolled in were pretty much non-existent. Um, and, and at that stage, they had unlimited, unlimited work rights if you got a student visa. So that meant that some people who came into the country on a student visa really just came in to work. Um, uh, so what they've done is they've reduced the, um, the amount of hours that can be worked by someone on a student visa to, I think, 48 hours per fortnight. So 24 hours a week, right. not full time. Um, uh, and so they, they can work enough kind of to keep themselves while they're studying, but not enough to encourage people to come and make it a full-time job. And they've also gotten tougher on who gets in. So I think the refusal rate's gone up from around 20% to about 90%. Um, 90% being refused yeah, for yeah, student visas. Yeah. These things tend to last not all that long. Um, uh, but every now and again, you've got to kind of sharpen uh, the scalpel up and make sure that you've uh, you've got it working well. And these are for the uh, vocational and education training uh, visas. So um, you know, all sorts of courses qualify for this. Well, I, I sent you a piece uh, late last week uh, um, uh, from the uh, uh, one of the anti-corruption. Uh, uh, web magazines that uh, I uh, subscribe to. 
Um, and uh, uh, in there, Jack, uh, it was talk of Albanian, uh, uh, sorry, Albanian uh, migration scams and Albanian crime, organised crime. Um, for those listeners who don't know much about uh, Albanian organised crime, it's known generically as, you know, similar to the mafia, uh, as Skipta. Uh, <coughs> and um, uh, it has profound links with groups like Lycosa Nostra and, and Drangheta. Um, and in fact, uh, the New York Five families, LCN families, uh, have used Albanians uh, for their dirty work quite considerably over the period. Um, and we're not trying to insinuate anything about the ethnicity of Albanian people, but there has been a, a, a rorting of the system uh, where generally mules, people who have been sent to do things and often reluctantly being <coughs> reluctantly leaving their countries to set up um, uh, a criminal enterprise in uh, in Australia often that might be owning a uh, or, or overseeing uh, a dope a dope smoking a dope uh, a dope growing house um, uh, uh, just to kick them off make some cash um, they'll arrive in the country presumably as refugees Jack or make making protect or making requests for protection for protect protection visas. Well, they uh, I read the piece and 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 there was an in implication that at least some um, immigration agents in 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 Australia were working yes. with the Albanian uh, organised crime groups to facilitate this. And from the article, it would suggest that they are applying for. Um, for asylum, for a refugee visa, and uh, the, the the usual way of doing that in these circumstances, there are five grounds to um, uh, in the Refugees Convention for being um, uh, being admitted. So you, you haven't. It's not just enough to be that if you're going back home, you're going to be persecuted. You've got to be persecuted from one of these five grounds: race, religion, nationality, political opinion. They're all reasonably straightforward. The last one is membership of a particular social group, and that's where all of the judicial activism really takes place. I mean, women and gays are now generally considered to be a particular social group because they weren't covered by the Refugee Convention. So if you were going to be persecuted because you were gay, there was really no um, remedy for it. <coughs> but in the case of the Albanians, generally they can claim um, look, I'm a member of a clan, and the clans within Albania are kind of recognised almost as tribes. So they they qualify. So you get in on that. The benefit of getting in on uh, of getting your claim started on that is that you get about five years at the moment before your claim's going to be dealt with. Um, and in the meantime, means, yep. In the meantime, a lot of crime. Happy days. Yeah, commit and, and a lot five, of crime. Five years is about a minimum, really. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, because if you run, run a couple of appeals and um, you can probably stretch that, you might, might stretch that to seven or eight, even more. Yeah, that particular that particular piece talked about the five-step process. Um, yep. Arriving in the country, making application for a protection visa, yep. uh, uh, going through that process, processes of appeals, committing a whole bunch of crimes while you're here, um, and, and then uh, at some point either the appeals process would exhaust itself and you'd be deported or you'd be pinged for whatever you're doing, whatever crimes you're committing, generally around drugs, uh, and uh, and you'd be uh, uh, charged and deported or convicted and jailed and then deported. Yeah, and the real problem is the long delay um, uh, in... Um in processing these applications. And that encourages further applications. At the moment, there's a hell of a lot of applicants from, from India, from Malaysia, uh, and f uh, particularly, um, that are what the lawyers call non-meritorious. They're very unlikely to succeed, but they're happy to make the application because they get they five more the, years. They, they know the process will years. take. And, yeah. and, and that's, a, that's a spiral. The more of those you have, the longer the time goes, so the more people are encouraged to take advantage of that. And the, the solution really is to speed up the processing. Yeah. Are we looking at a, a well post-pandemic lag, Jack? Is that it, or is it just the process itself needs to no, be? No, this was this this had started before. Up. This had started pre-COVID. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, look, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Albanian crime gangs, what they get up to. Um, we are looking at, uh, um, uh, and we covered this on the Two Jacks a couple of weeks ago, uh, we're looking at a, a fair amount of turf-related crime, very violent crime, people being shot dead in our streets, in uh, uh, in Sydney in particular. Some of that's moved to Melbourne. And this is partly due to a clash between the existing order of drug distribution in the, in, in, in Australia uh, coming up against newer players who are uh, <coughs> not beholden to what's called the Commission, which is a Comanchero-affiliated um, a group who set prices create distribution networks, and now you've got new players coming in. Um, they don't want to uh, bow and scrape to the commission uh, or to the Comanchero. Most of the Comanchero, most of the bigwigs are in Turkey or in or in the Emirates, um, living in the Emirates. Uh, and, of course, there, there's, your, there's your turf conflict right there. So that's why a lot of, a lot of this stuff is happening. So I'll be touching on this in the conditional release program, but uh, thank you, Jack, for explaining the immigration law problem uh, that we have, the gap. You might call it a gap. Culturally, well, well, there is a problem with with the speed of processing. Uh, I spent 10 years on what was then called the Refugee Review Tribunal, which is now part of the AAT. Um, and when they set up the Refugee Review Tribunal, they, the, the founding principle was that the processing had to be fair, just, informal, economical and quick. And they've lost the last one of those. So the third one. Yeah, third one's yeah. just uh, gone missing a little yeah. bit. Um, um, and, and just trying to say, culturally, um, you, you look at Albania and you've got to remember that a generation ago it was a um, semi-feudal communist kleptocracy. Um, uh, so uh, for uh, most current Albanians, things like the rule of law are a kind of an inconvenient novelty. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that, yeah, that, there is a very strong cultural thing. And, of course, you had this process after Hoxha departed. That's uh, their, uh, I mean, a, a very curious country, Albania. It, it, its, its only ally was, uh, was Mao's China for, for many, many years. It, it, it didn't yeah, have much to do with the Soviets. That- Enver, um, Enver Hoxha had a prickly relationship with the, the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and and then all of that collapsed with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they went through this sort of transition, much as the Russians did. All right, who, so who's going to run energy? Who's going to run? Uh, who, who's going to run education? Who's going to run our retail sectors? Who's going to run our resource sectors? And all of a sudden, you had this kind of um, uh, cronyism. Uh, 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 in much the same way as Russia. So if you are an Albanian, um, uh, you'd be looking at things like the rule of law with an eyebrow raised and uh, and so, <laughs> you know, what's in it for me and maybe yeah. I should go out and make <laughs> make sure that uh, that I'm looking after myself. Yeah, well, the, the Albanians make up an extraordinary proportion of the cross-channel migrants uh, going into uh, the UK at the moment and it's generally thought that they organise the whole thing. Um, uh, but um, yes, quite uh, well known in people smuggling, uh, well known in drugs in, in drug circles as well. Very very close allies with the Endrangheta, which is the Calabrian mafia, and La Cosa Nostra, which is a weakened group now, uh, the Sicilian mafia, um, and both well, all three have very similar sort of backgrounds. They are clannish. They rely on you know there is a hierarchical order. There is uh, uh, um, uh, blood connections, um, uh, and, and and all three groups, whether it's LCN, Skipta, or uh, or, or Ndrangheta, um, come from impoverished parts of Europe. I mean, well, that's the Al- history of it. Albania is a short ferry ride to Bari in Italy, so it's not that's not not all that yeah, far. Just, it's just across the uh, what is it, the uh, Adriatic. Yeah, um, the um, uh, I'm told um, uh, from from friends who've been there, it's a tremendously good place to go on holidays. Oh, beautiful, yeah, um, because it's a, a beautiful country to look at. Uh, the food's pretty good, uh, uh, and the booze is good, and it's all very cheap. All very cheap, and, and there's no problem at all. But that's a little bit like places in Asia where um, 
all of those kind of um, disputes between clans, etc., take place out of the tourism areas and out of the public eye. It's a bit like being in Hong Kong. No one wants to see the triads choppering each other down in one chai. Yeah, true enough. Um, um, Andrew Getter, who are one of the most powerful organised criminal, criminal syndicates in the world, only 30 years ago, this is how things can change so quickly, only 30 years ago, they'd always paid sort of, you know, second fiddle to La Cosa Nostra. Uh, <coughs> and Which the, is the Sicilians, yes. Which yes. are the Sicilians. The Sicilians got so out of control, they decided to blow up judges. So they decided to blow up one judge. And the Italian government decided, well, that's enough, and cracked down on them. And Andrangheta at the time were involved in those sort of old organised clan or, or criminal clan type crimes, abduction, extortion, um, <clears throat> those sorts of things. And all of a sudden, with LCN sort of being repressed, uh, 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 the Italian government brought in uh, life sentences um, uh, for, uh, for, for those found guilty of organised crimes in, in Sicily and, uh, and, and long, uh, long-term jail terms uh, in, uh, you know, in solitary confinement. And, so and in, that, and, and in, and they weakened. And, and, and in Naples as well, I think the Neapolitans uh, suffered. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 that, and that's true too. But in, in this, Endrangheta got basically overlooked and they became the powerhouse with the Albanians. It's very, very close collaboration, the powerhouse around the supply of cocaine. Endrangheta are supposed to be responsible for 80% of Europe's cocaine. You can only imagine how much money that's worth. But Endrangheta, on <clears throat> on a on an estimate, uh, have a bigger turnover than BHP Billiton. They should list on the exchange, really. <laughs> <laughs> they might be a little bit more efficient. I'm not so sure about that. There was a recording uh, of an Andrangheta um, uh, capo talking to a foot soldier uh, there'd been a large amount of money buried, sort of palletized American dollars buried, and uh, they uh, the the foot soldier was in the process of disinterring this from the ground, and he rang up the boss and said, "Oh, there's a fair bit of money that's ruined." He said, "How much?" He says, "Oh, it's twenty five minutes. Twenty five minutes. He said, just throw it out. Just throw it." Out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So this is uh, this is where we come. They come from impoverished areas, clannish. Blood ties, hierarchical structure, and uh, they don't feel like the world owes them a living, so they'll go out and make one for themselves. Um, and that's what we've got uh, happening in Australia and responsible for a great deal of the shooting. So I'd suggest the one in Bondi Junction, Jack, would be one where the Albanians are involved in one form or another. Anyway, we're going to go, uh, we're going to go now over to the United States and... Uh, uh, we know that uh, in T-shirt sales alone, the mugshot of Donald Trump has kicked in seven point one million US dollars um, in less uh, than a towards week. the Trump towards the Trump campaign. Well, towards Trump, we don't know exactly where the money's landing, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's seven million dollars in a week. Yeah, yeah, seven million dollars in a week, um, and and obviously sort of small donors, people buying 30, 30 bucks for a t-shirt. Oh, 30, 25, 25 uh, from, what from, we coffee mug. mugs are twenty five and thirty four <laughs> t-shirts. T-shirt. <laughs> t-shirts. I did see yesterday um, uh, that Mark Meadows, uh, Don, Donald Trump's uh, uh, chief of staff. Was before the Atlanta, before the um, uh, Fulton County Courthouse um, uh, requesting or submitting that he be heard in a federal court, not a uh, uh, not uh, not uh, the Fulton County or Georgia State Court, um, and uh, that decision is pending at the moment. A number of applications have been made there, and it is and it is thought likely that Trump might do that. Why would they want to go federal rather than state? Is it because of the five-year minimum mandatory sentence, Jack? Yeah, it could be. I think it does sound like <laughs> we've just got to look at it. If we get pinged for this, there's there's really no judicial discretion. We're away for five minimum. Uh, so, and, yes. And, and if you're going to go away, you'd be better off in a federal prison. 
Yeah, they talk about the prison farms. I was watching a rather lovely documentary about the um, about the um, uh, about the doping of uh, athletes, uh, uh, baseball and so forth. And uh, the the um, organizer there from San Francisco, uh, he uh, did a bit of time at a prison farm. Not too bad, tennis court, swimming pool, all that sort of stuff. Uh, now, Trump didn't turn up for the GOP debate, the first of them last week. Who performed well, Jack? Uh, I didn't watch it all. I watched bits and pieces of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Nikki Haley was the, um, uh, the standout performer, in my view, um, uh, and Ron DeSantis was solid. They were the two best. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Vivek. I'm told it's pronounced Ramaswamy. Ramaswamy uh, he's a very yeah. he's a very odd individual. <laughs> he's a little bit strange. Yeah. Um, uh, so, did... so, so his supporters thought he did well, but he didn't go well at all. Now Nikki Harley, and, probably and, 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 the star and, of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the polling shows that um, uh, Ron DeSantis is still easily number two in the in the GOP primary, um, but she's come out of the. Uh, uh, three and four percent pack to be. Um, uh, she's jumped out of that out of that bottom rung now. She's a, a clear third uh, third placer. Yeah, uh, and uh, we did see a little bit of a mo- bit of a moment there with Ronda Sanders, which has has been sort of amplified, blowing up. But he 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 finished his uh, little little uh, little spiel and said, "I will." Act for you, and then he tried to smile, and it was oh, yeah, it's really hard to look at. <laughs> he doesn't smile well. He does not smile no, well. No, he doesn't. Right. Um, um, it's a thing that um, that Trump still has over all of the GOP primary uh, candidates, with perhaps the exception of Nikki Haley, who does seem quite good at this, um, and probably over Joe Biden as well. Trump has this advantage: is that he genuinely likes people and likes performing. Um, and he has some. Oh, he likes. I don't think he likes people. I mean, he's a sociopath. So I mean, he just looks at people as as marks. But but he does enjoy the entertainment side of it. Yeah, You're absolutely he right there. And he, and he and he has some sense of comedic timing, um, uh, and uh, so he can perform. Um, almost no one else. Ron DeSantis doesn't have that. Um, Nikki Haley's got a bit of it, uh, and Joe might have had it once, but doesn't have it anymore. Yeah, one of the one of the poorer performers um, uh, was the uh, former New Jersey governor, and um, uh, I thought he might go well in the debates, but no. he got booed and had all sorts of problems when he had a go at Donald Trump. Um, uh, can, can what- I, can I just just so I saw a poll this morning. Um, uh, a reasonably substantial number, and and Biden and Trump had a hundred percent name recognition. So there's well, no yes. everyone knows who they are now. They've been around forever, um, uh, and and they were asked which words, and they're given a list of words um, as to which fitted with both of them. Um, uh, the winners with Biden were old and confused, um, and you think that's bad. The winners with Trump were corrupt and dishonest. Um, uh, so <laughs> you can't you can't knock the American public on that on yeah, that result that, alone. They've got, no, they actually no. got them sp- spot on. Spot on. Um, uh, neither neither of them. Uh, both of them have a, a, a much higher than fifty percent unfavorability rating. Mm. So by and large, the American people say we don't want either of those. Trump's about ten points in front. Um, on the unfavorability, that is, he's ten percent more unfavorable. Yeah. But they're I both that, well over fifty percent. I think that's going to get worse, not better. Um, mm. uh, I mean, look, uh, we've talked about this, but I, I, I certainly think what's going to happen in DC is where, you know, the four count indictment there. I think that's really going to be something that's going to put him away. Now that that trial will begin in March. I think it's a day before, maybe not Super Tuesday, but it's a day before. Uh, a significant uh, primary election. Um, uh, I honestly think this is the trial America needs to see because they can't continue. We saw this in the midterms. Nikki Lake, Nikki Lake, uh, not uh, not uh, um, not Nikki, the 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 Arizona GOP gubernatorial uh, candidate. Um, you know, didn't accept that she got beaten. You know, just kept talking about electoral fraud. And they need to fix this. Um, <clears throat> and if it gets messy, and it's going to get messy, uh, so be it, I reckon. Um, but anyway, we'll move on. Uh, also in America, Jack, uh, the wildfires in Maui, in Maui absolutely terrible 
um, still many, many people missing. Uh, Mainly and, children. Yeah, and and uh, I, I, you wouldn't expect them to be found. Um, as it stands, the death count is over a hundred. The fire, uh, the, the 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 wildfire, particularly dry in Hawaii at the moment. Um, uh, at the tail end of a hurricane to the north of the island basically fanned incredible, incredibly strong winds and uh, it was uh, just an appalling set of circumstances. But there seems to, a, there seems to, to be a, a failure a, in terms of emergency response, Jack. I was talk, talking to a, a friend who lives in Honolulu in Hawaii uh, and, and the, the, the general feeling there is that people kind of expect there'll be a 1,000 people killed. That's where the, the number one is. going to get up there. I think there are, yeah, and, many and, missing. And, 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 and I think about 120 confirmed dead at this stage. And, and, and Hawaii is a strange place where there's still a fair bit of, um, how to put this politely, there's still, still a fair bit of uh, efforts to kind of look after the native Hawaiians um, so that they get, um, the, the right jobs, competence unrelated, if you like. Um, there's still a fair few um, captain's picks that go into these jobs. Um, and I've seen the, the interviews. The governor's not bad, but once you get down below that, particularly in, in, a, um, in Maui, um, the local officials just look pretty incompetent. And some of the mistakes, if they are true, look horrendous. They closed the, it seems that they barricaded the only um, uh, sealed road out of the, the town um, to prevent people from leaving because there were power lines down. Um, and, and a hell of a lot of the people died. You can see the, what's it called Front Street. There's just lines of cars who couldn't go anywhere because they, they weren't allowed to leave. Mm. Um, as we found in Australia and in California, a lot of the blame for this is going to go on the power companies who just didn't maintain the power lines properly. Um, uh, there's there's all of, there's all of that, but there's the emergency and, and, response, and, 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 Jack. And and they and they they needed to release water for the firefighters from a dam upstream so that the firefighters could fight the thing, and they didn't do it. Yeah, the, look, the emergency response, you might recall oh, several years ago that uh, the uh, Hawaiian uh, statewide um, uh, emergency response lit up uh, with uh, uh, a thought of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> aliens landing, nuclear response, the whole thing just uh, came mm. out of nowhere. So there wasn't... And on this occasion, around the Maui fires, there was no response. There was no, no, no text messages sent to citizens. There were no warnings issued publicly. They have, they have, they have a siren system which they didn't use. Yeah. So there are some absolute failures here, and there's a lot of conspiracy theory stuff growing out of this. Um, Jack um, saying that this is a grab for. Uh, for land from, um, you know, major developers. That's one theory. Another one is, I believe, uh, Oprah Winfrey's got a, got a property there and that she's involved in more and more property. Barack Obama has a property on another island and he's supposed to be involved in this. Uh, what, we are, what we are looking at is bad enough and it, it, without all the, you know, myriad and lurid conspiracies, um, are just an absolute failure of government. Um, it's it's the to old get story. People out, to let people know and then get them out. It's the old story. If you've got a choice between a conspiracy and a cock up, take the cock up every yeah, time. Exactly right. Very very sad business. Now the ALP, Jack, we, we are we sort of now, going back this, to Australia, yeah, this, but we're but we're dealing with one island, Jack. Wouldn't it be? Isn't it about time we had one island, the Republic? Uh, and, North, and, and Northern Ireland was was uh, uh, just treated as the historical joke that it is. Uh, this reminds me of the um, a rural uh, uh, New South Wales paper um, uh, back in um, uh, 1917, I think, or 1915, I think, during the First World War. They had a banner headline, We Warn the Tsar. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and proceeded to write an editorial about what they thought the Tsar of Russia was doing wrong. 
um, all the way from Orange or somewhere like Dubbo or somewhere in New South Wales. Um, what on earth the, um, the, 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 the ALP conference was doing, devoting itself to the future of, of Ulster, I don't know, but it did amuse me. It is kind of funny. I mean, look, uh, one of the uh, uh, possible consequences of Brexit is uh, the forming of one island under the Republic, um, but it's true to say that the Northern Irish people, um, the majority at least, uh, are quite happy being under British rule. Now, uh, we need to look at some polling on that. But basically what you have there are the old sectarian lines drawn and the Presby- and, and, sorry, the Presbyterians, the, Pro- the Protestants uh, remain in the majority, Jack. They do. The other question is, would the Republic of Ireland want them? Uh, yes, there is a little bit of that. There's there's uh, quite a lot of uh, activity, um, industrial activity in Belfast at the moment. A lot of shipbuilding, uh, very famous for that, um, and uh, and and uh, a lot of these uh, cruise ships that are being built all the time. They uh, they tend to get knocked out in uh, in Belfast. Um, it, yeah. it's, it's one of the reasons a, for spoken, behind the troubles. Spoken to a few Irish people about this. Yeah, I haven't spoken to a few Irish people about this. Sorry about that. Our, our lines of communication went up now. Um, uh, I seriously doubt whether they want them, um, uh, whether they want them back. Um, they, they, they think they're probably going to be more trouble than they're worth. Well, going back to pre the Troubles, Jack, it was always the Protestants always thought that the Catholics would breed them into minority, breed the Protestants then into minority and then take over. That was basically the substance of it. There's a, uh, there's a hell of a good book that uh, if anyone wants to read a history of the Troubles that's uh, uh, where a snapshot of a particularly unpleasant abduction and murder takes place, which is uh, um, currently being investigated, an historical murder in, in and around the Troubles. Uh, it's called Say Nothing, uh, and uh, it's uh, really, really a fine, fine read. A, a, a brilliant writer. I'll, I'll get his name, and uh, and uh, uh, it's Keith from Emma, uh, from from memory. But I'll, uh, I'll I'll get his name as we go through. Really, a really beautiful history of of the troubles. Takes no particular stance, uh, but follows this murder of a of a woman, a mother of twelve, Jack, who was grabbed by the provost. Uh, in her apartment, in her flat, uh, and in front of the children, taken away, and never seen again. Yeah, uh, I've, 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 I'm, I'm aware of the book, and I'm aware of the story. Um, yes, and uh, and it is the subject of a of a current murder inquiry. But uh, it's a beautifully beautifully written book laces the troubles in around it. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, uh, one island would be a lovely thing, but maybe. Comes with its own comes with its own set of set of difficulties. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jack Pregosin, when we talk about a murder, is he dead? Mm. Uh, it would the Russians said the DNA analysis, <laughs> if you can believe them, has proven that he was on board. His deputy of Wagner is also uh, is also was also killed, or he was certainly on the manifest. Put it that way. Um, there was a lovely piece there from Liam Mendes, uh, one of the great young journalists at, uh, at The Australian, who's over in Ukraine at the moment, walking around and uh, talking to Ukrainians. And there was a celebratory mood, but also a little bit of cynicism about uh, where the Prigozhin actually was dead. I'd suggest he is, um, but that's only a guess. Um, and... Uh, and Wagner will just simply change. It will see, they will rebrand it. It is pronounced Wagner, by the way, Jack. Well, I was just checking that because I noticed on Everyone the ABC mispronounces it. On, on the on the ABC the other day, um, uh, some young person was ostentatiously pronouncing it was Wagner. I thought I was watching the Ring Cycle in Strasbourg. Well, that's what it's named after, you yes. see. So there, you know, there's there's this very strong sort of neo-Nazi connection that that uh, that uh, um, 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 
brands it around uh, the uh, the composer Wagner, this is Wagner. Yeah. So so um, uh, yeah, so it is definitely pronounced. So they will simply rebrand this, um, the Russians that is, and continue their activities in Africa, uh, in South America, uh, and elsewhere, where they are basically just uh, robbing robbing countries blind at the moment. Can I, can I suggest Tchaikovsky? No, well, no, that's 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 wrong country, wrong branding. But they will have they will rebrand it. Wagner won't exist, but it'll be called something else. And it is an expression of Russian foreign policy um, that uh, that uh, that these groups are active, basically just in in the business of stealing resources in countries like Central African Republic, um, uh, elsewhere in Western Africa. Um, and they'll continue to do that because it's gold. Apparently, his apparently uh, uh, Prigozhin's last words, at least on Telegram, were "I need more gold." Mm. You don't need anywhere you're going, mate. Um, no good to you now. Um, <clears throat> and he was defenestrated, Jack. He probably was. Um, uh, the um, well, yeah. you, you and I were exchanging WhatsApps about this when the news first came out and, and making the obvious point that just because his name was on the passenger manifest doesn't That's mean that he was on the plane. True enough, uh, true enough. Yeah, look, I, I reckon it's about 90% certain he was on the manifest. Now. Yeah, the Russians yeah. say that they've got the DNA, they've done yeah. all of that. Um, I did see some uh, silly sort of uh, conspiracy theory saying that it really was... <laughs> Vladimir Putin, who just had a gutful of uh, of Yevgeny Prigozhin, it was actually that the pilot had a heart attack uh, because he'd been vaccinated. And I thought, gee, that that'd be an interesting sort of shifting through the wreckage. Have a look at this charred ember of a human being over here. Oh, gee, he looks like he's had a heart attack. Um, but that's just an example of how all of these conspiracy theories meld into one if you give them long enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it never ceases to surprise me. Meanwhile, Jack, um, a prominent Russian ally to this day under Modi, uh, has uh, uh, India has landed on the moon. Um, in fact, it comes in the wake of the Russian an attempt to uh, send an unmanned uh, spacecraft to the moon that blew up, um, but the Indians have, have got it, and they are in the what's called the South Pole of the Moon. Um, I, I and- wouldn't call I wouldn't call India an ally of Russia. I just think that the Indians believe you should still st- should still do business with Russia. And they're, well, and they're happy to buy things from Russia. I wouldn't, wouldn't call them an ally by any means. I don't know. Just have a drive around Delhi and have a look at the uh, the Russian embassy there, mate, compared to the Chinese one. Mm. <laughs> it's pretty big. Um, well, 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 well they're, they're not poking guns at each other like the Indians are with the Chinese. That makes a difference. But I don't no, think they're true. quite... No, they're, they're a long historical... Um, uh, long, long historical distrust between the Indians and the Chinese. Anyway, Jack... India is now on the moon, and 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 an unmanned craft that that must be said. But they're on the south pole of the moon, and I guess a lot of people are wondering why. Why is this? Why is there a fascination with landing on the moon again um, after a long period where it was uh, just left alone? Um, <clears throat> and um, I guess part of the answer to that is that uh, it will be a launching pad to Mars. That's one thing. But also the South Pole is likely to be found to have some water there, Jack. Um, and, uh, and and if there is water there, then obviously it could be used for human consumption, but also it can be used to extract hydrogen from. So it looks like more and more as uh, the Chinese, the Americans, the Indians and others um, uh, turn towards the moon again. It's 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 likely that they want to turn it into a huge sort of petrol station. Mm, quite possible. And that's what uh, that's what seems to be on the go at the moment. Anyway, wonderful achievement for India. Um, uh, the Vikram lander from Chandrayaan three successfully touched down as planned at six o four local time. That's Indian time. Um, yesterday, um, 
And celebrations have broken out across the country with Prime Minister Narendra Modi saying India is now on the moon. So there you go. Meanwhile, Jack, and I have to check this story out because it seems so silly. Uh, in energy, the the you know, the Biden government is saying that ceiling fans will have to be not removed because I think there's a <laughs> that's been the usual sort of paranoid jibber from the right wing, um, but uh, that the energy department is analysing ceiling fans to make them more efficient. Isn't that right? Yeah, um, and they say if they redo the ceiling van industry, it'll save you $39 a year. And you well, have to, we're run, have about to, new have to wonder why you bother. Yeah, you're talking about new constructions. But this, I mean, this, this happens all the time. If you buy an air conditioner now and use it, it's going to be more efficient than the one that you, that you could have bought two years ago. Yeah. And, and, and that happens without any government interference. Uh, uh, it, it tends to, yeah, that's right. Because when this, and essentially, well, this is what's happening with the ceiling fans: is that is that the Department of Energy is going to is going to propose a way in which they've been uh, made more efficient. But it's not as if it's compulsory, Jack. I mean, uh, you know, you'll be able to buy your cheap fans from China and elsewhere. Uh, anyway, uh, no, that's they're not. They're not talking about making this a voluntary thing. These things happen. People move to more efficient stuff on their own. The government should just get out of it. All right, fair enough. Uh, misinformation. misinformation. Yeah, I like this. Um, uh, um, I, I just liked it because it's Alistair Campbell. You remember him? He was Tony Blair's spin doctor. Um, uh, yes, uh, he was during the, the, during the the Blair government. He's now so fond of the truth that he thinks that uh, MPs who who mislead the House of Commons should be able to be prosecuted and, and ne- if necessary, jailed. Yes, he's uh, the Malcolm Tucker character uh, from the thick of it. I mean, based loosely upon him, yes. of course. A, you know, media manager uh, and spruker, and not opposed to telling a few porkies. But yeah, he reckons uh, MPs who, I guess, they deliberately mislead the house should be jailed. Exactly right. Well, no, what, I- what's the what's the penalty for it now? Um, nothing really. <laughs> That's the, see, this is the problem. We don't have to go. We don't have to go to um, fourth gear straight away. But the, this is the problem, and we saw this. You know, I mean, uh, technically, Scott Morrison was misleading the Parliament every day he stood in front of it for much of the um, much of the period from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty two, and. Uh, Nothing much but a bit of a scathing report, and he's still sitting in the parliament <laughs> pulling in 200,000 a year plus perks. Hmm. Uh, who's Gina Miller? Help me she's, out. She's the, she's the, um, uh, she has her own little political party. She was the lead person in the anti Brexit uh, lawsuits. She took the government to court, um, and she has. Uh, uh, a, a strong and significant niche support in, within, right. within London and the UK. Well, she said, imagine if we had a system in the UK where politicians were criminally investigated and charged for lying or making false statements. Now, I reckon if you put that to a poll in the UK, <laughs> probably worse in the UK, in, in Australia, in the United States, it, you'd get about a 90% uh, positive uh, response. It'd be good for lawyers because the courts would be very, very busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, I mean, we do have a problem. We do have a problem where misleading the parliament under the um, <clears throat> under Westminster, under the Westminster traditions, should be the end of your, certainly of any sort of ministerial career. It should be the end of any sort of um, 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 a committee role that you might be playing if you're not a minister. Um and it's just not observed anymore. I mean, we go back to what 1996 and seven, uh, and 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 John Howard came up with his um, with his uh, 
list of uh, uh, ministerial requirements. And his, his ministerial code of conduct. Code of conduct, thank you. And uh, <laughs> within about a year, I think 11 of them were gone. Yeah, something uh, like that. So uh, they quickly uh, worked out that was yeah, such a great plan. Not, not to change the ethics, we just have to change the... the the code um, to make it uh, to make it a little less punitive. Um, so yeah, so these uh, these things kind of these things kind of happen. I mean, really, for all the malfeasance in the in the um, uh, in in the Morrison government twenty nineteen to twenty uh, twenty eighteen to twenty uh, twenty two, uh, the fact that only one minister had to resign. Uh, over that whole period is uh, quite simply astonishing, isn't it? Yeah, but have they paid a political cost? Yes, they have, and um, and we'll be paying it for quite a while. Sure enough, that is a good point that you make there. Um, you know, if if it looks bent, uh, then it probably is, and voters will react accordingly. Um, all right. Well, we're going to uh, we're going to go into sport. Jack, we're a little bit early going into sport today, but we've got much to get through. Yes. Um. Uh. Let's simply talk first about the game day experience. Now, when's the last time you were at a AFL footy game, Jack? Uh, you mean live? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Long time. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think I've been in the country for about six years, so, um, uh, and a bit longer than that, probably about eight years. I, I went to Marvel a, a couple of years ago, and um, the light flashing on and off, I found it most disturbing. I don't reckon anyone <laughs> had a predisposition for seizures uh, would have to avert their eyes. Um, uh, is it just getting too noisy, you know, a bit like T20? Um, just too much loud music and not enough sport? Well, this sort of stuff um, uh, really kicked off um, uh, in Hong Kong. I mean, they've they always had music in American sport. They have the, the guy on the organ at the baseball and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the Hong Kong Sevens really supercharged this idea that you needed the game day experience. Lots of noise, lots of colour, lots of movement. Um, uh, and, but that's because Sevens Rugby is a completely rubbish product. Um, and the whole idea of the, com- of the Hong Kong Sevens is that you go along and get um, uh, fairly smashed um, and sing along to the songs, and in between there's a few Sevens Rugby games. So right. you need that. for, for w- When you've got a rubbish product, you actually need all this stuff. But AFL is a terrific product. You don't need any of this at all. Yes, well, Rowan Connolly, who uh, does a sports blog, and stuff, I think he's uh, no longer at the age, but they run his uh, they run his uh, podcast there, I think, uh, or certainly on a platform for it. He said he was in old codger territory. Now he's, he's he'd be about our age, Rowan. Yeah, he's roughly our age. Yep. Uh, old codger territory, I know, but I sat out in the crowd last night at the MCG and swear. I mean, usually, usually he's in a box working for a radio station. So, well, this yeah, is that's it. right, that's right. So, you know, that, that you are you are um, uh, a bit uh, compartmentalised from what's going on there. So he's in the crowd this time. I swear, the wall to wall white noise has risen to unbearable levels. Ads, stupid promos, basketball style intros, demands to make some noise. Can't even talk to people you're sitting with. Unbearable. So I guess Rowan Connolly won't be going to the AFL anymore. If it's unbearable, that's it, isn't it? No, he'll be back in. He'll be back in the box working for. I think he works for SEN. Um, uh, um, um, I, yeah. Well, um, uh, he, he made his point. Oh, look, I, the last game I went to was the Swannies game, um, and um, and it's always a good crowd. It was a good natured crowd. I didn't see any exhortation to sing, dance or do anything like that. They do have a, a Sweet Caroline plays, but it's always when there's no, you know, no no actual footy being played, uh, generally post-goal or uh, uh, end of a quarter. I, I don't see anything really wrong. I'm just on my limited experience of it. Um, it, it really is old codger, old codger stuff. I don't like that music. I don't like that noise and all those lights. Anyway, um, that, that well, I, I, I quite like it at the Hong Kong Sevens. I just don't think the AFL needs it. 
Oh, yeah, but look, I mean, look, they do flash the lights at, at Marvel a fair bit, which is a little bit unnerving, but um, I, I think overall uh, there's, there is genuine respect for the, for the game uh, and what happens, you know, in the breaks of the game. It's uh, just part of the whole part of the whole entertainment package, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm quite content to watch it from, from Hong Kong with the sound turned down so I can't hear uh, uh, Brian Taylor and Dwayne Russell. Um, oh, I, like, I like Dwayne Russell. I think he's probably one of the better callers. Um, they, I mean, uh, I think um, one, one fellow you've picked out, uh, former... St Kilda wingman uh, grand finalist. Uh, I think he's very, very good. He calls the game and he does some special comment stuff as well. I'm just trying to think of his name. Uh, Joey Montagna. Joey Montagna. Montagna. Yeah, Joe Montagna. I, 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 don't, I, I don't see him as a comment. I don't, haven't watched him as a commentator, but um, he does a couple of um, he's a, good a couple, couple of radio shows and he's excellent on those. Yeah, he's good call. As, as, as is the former Carlton and Collingwood player, Daisy Thomas. Yeah, he's good. got a future in the game. Yeah, look, I think we get a bit... And get a bit over BT, and uh, and his mate James Brayshaw calling the games, um, and uh, it might be nice to flip it over to get some younger stock in there, Jack. Well, I, just... I got over BT when uh, we paid him. Uh, I think I had, I had to give him out of my own. I gave him a bottle of scotch for coaching uh, Melbourne Law School against Monash Law School. That's back in about nineteen eighty four. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, money well spent just to get rid of him. Um, yeah. Uh, probably the side that finished worst in the comp, just on form, although they didn't finish on the bottom of the ladder, was Essendon, Jack, and they just looked like they clocked off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brad Scott, um, uh, uh, I saw his interview and he said, I don't think it's a fitness issue. We run the best running teams in the competition to wins or very close losses. There's a difference between training hard to what an uh, to between training hard and to what an AFL lifestyle looks like. So that's what I'm, what I'm more concerned about. Now, I have to remember that uh, round uh, 17, they were fifth. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, their, their last by, month's by contrast, been terrible. Like, by contrast, the Swannies were 15th round <laughs> 17. You know? I think uh, uh, Cartman wouldn't have been far away from them. But, but you know, I mean, they, they were playing a game against the Giants for you know they had, they needed to win the needed to win that one and the one after it and they just didn't turn up mate I mean the Giants are a good side but they're not a hundred and twenty point better side uh, than Essendon yeah I I just can't recall a team um, uh, putting the cue in the rack so <laughs> with so clearly was, with, with, with two, exactly with two like rows that. to go they, two they rounds were, to go they were terrible against Collingwood as well. Um, uh, and yeah, it did look like they clocked off at round 20. Uh, what have we got? 23, 24, I think it is now. They clocked off two rounds early anyway. Let's, put, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's that's the Eagles. Done okay. the Eagles had the Eagles had, had a couple of wins out of nowhere, and and um, and North Melbourne finished. I think that no, 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 North had a win, didn't they? And uh, they've, yeah, they've they finished second bottoms. Won, won their last one. I just say about Essendon that you have to look at the whole season, and um, uh, and if if you're still fifth after round seventeen, um, then you must have some talent uh, and you must have some ability. Um, but there's something else badly wrong yeah. if you if you turn off that bad that much too that, much yeah bad. look it was quite extraordinary the other thing to say jack is that it's a long season it's not quite as long as the nrl but it's a long season hmm. and for young guys who haven't had that three four um uh pre-seasons under their belts um you know it can be a, a case of you still want to go but the body can't go anymore um and i saw a little bit of that on the weekend uh, not just in Essendon. Um, anyway, we have a final series now with the AFL. Um, Collingwood will play Melbourne at the G. Um, uh, Port Adelaide play Brisbane at uh, at the Gabba, where uh, the Brisbane Lions are yet to be beaten there this year. Carlton will play Sydney at the G. And um, 
uh, St Kilda will play the Giants at, at uh, also at the at, at the MCG. I think that's a really going to be a terrific game. Just I mean, there are going to be some great games, but that St Kilda uh, GWS game uh, is going to be a ripper. It's going to be very hard. They're both very physical sides, um, but the trouble is. Uh, if you win that one, manage to scrape away with a win and a few bruised bodies, you're going to either have to play Brisbane in Brisbane or you're going to have to play Port Adelaide in Adelaide. Mm. Um, Carlton, Melbourne, sorry, Carlton, Sydney, the winner of that will uh, play the loser of the Collingwood Melbourne game. And that provides them a bit of an in. Uh, they'll have a preliminary final probably away, uh, either of those two sides, if they. Um, uh, if they manage to uh, beat Melbourne or Collingwood and then go into a prelim. Um, so, so who's the chance, do you think? Well, look, Collingwood deserve to be favourites. Um, I see Carlton about uh, 10 to 1 to win the flag. I think that's not too bad because they do have a reasonable run. They won't have to play, let's say they beat Sydney. They'll, they beat Melbourne or Collingwood so they can get through that. And then there'll, there'll be a preliminary final where they'll have to win probably away. They'll have to they'll have to put they'll have to play, you know, potentially a Port Adelaide or a, or a Brisbane um, away. <coughs> that makes it a bit difficult. Uh, the Swans are fifty to one to win the flag. Um, uh, I when we talk about clocking off, I saw them against Melbourne. Uh, saw him play against Melbourne. I think they're, they're going pretty well, but then Melbourne just put the foot on the gas in the last quarter, and Sydney just couldn't couldn't keep you know couldn't keep up with them, and that made me think that maybe they they might have gone a game too long too. The um, uh, well, sorry, I can't, I can't, they'll all I be fresh. Re- <laughs> I can't recall the year when all eight finalists are going in in fairly good form. Yeah, there's no – well, probably the side that's got the least form is Collingwood. Yeah, that's probably right. But, and, and they're the favourites. They're, so, and they're the favourites. I've, personally, I think the Swans have just kind of fallen into the eight and, and eight is about where they belong. Um, uh, but given the season they've had, that's a very good coaching result. Um, but, yeah, no, I think all eight of them are in reasonably good nick. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think the Giants are a very good side. They beat Carlton on the weekend. I thought they would, to be honest, um, because they had a bit more to play for. Uh, but they're a very good side, and they've got mm. talent everywhere. Um, if you want to you want a tip, I, my tip is Brisbane to win the flag. Mm. Just because they'll play, well, the way the results should go, They'll, they'll, they should beat Port Adelaide. Then they'll have a preliminary final in Brisbane, and then they get the grand final. And then, well, they weren't going all that well at the G, but they have sort of turned that, you know, little bugbear around. I, I think they look like the best side in it. Collingwood not out of it. Melbourne certainly not out of it. Now the Clayton Oliver's back in the side, winning a lot of hard footy for them. Port Adelaide, you know, they're in the mix. Um, uh, and the Blues, if they can get a, a get a bit of a run on, um, Carlton have, uh, have pretty much got an, uh, got uh, got everyone available. Uh, quite extraordinary. Um, Silvani's f- uh, fit and ready. Matt Kennedy's fit and ready. Cripps is through. Doherty's through. So they've got a pretty much a full list to pick from. It's going to be very interesting. But we're going to have to wait for a week, aren't we, Jack? Is that a good idea or, or not, having a no, week off? No, I don't off? like it. I think if you ask the players, you'd get a completely different answer, wouldn't you? Because yep. when we talk about these guys, you know, like Essendon, for example, you've, you've got these niggles, you've got, you've got injuries, you've got things that are, that are working, not enough to keep you out of a game, but um, but uh, just to just to just to have that week to fresh it up um, uh, would be very very popular with the players, um, and, and of course the AFLW. They're using the uh, the week's absence to uh, kick off that season, Jack. So that's something yeah. I look forward to. Yep, and and, right. and and they'll get a few extra eyeballs. Now it's it's it's, it's that's clever um, uh, it's marketing. Just a bit of marketing, yeah, a bit of marketing and, and picking a thing. Uh, yeah, there, there is you know, a, a fair amount of debate about the week off, um, but um, I think if you ask the players, they'd be all over yeah. it. So, so of the, of the others who didn't make the eight. Who's a winner? 
Give me, give me a winner or two out of that. Oh, it's hard to know. I mean, the Suns, you know, they sacked the coach mid mid season. Um, uh, that was pretty awful. Uh, Essendon clearly not. I think North Melbourne are going the right way about it, um, and it'll take some time. Um, uh, the, the, it, it is going to be a very good draft. There's a standout draft player. His name's Harley Reid. Standout draft player will probably go to the Eagles, but the, the, the rest of the draft is very, very good. So I think North aren't far away. Who else have we got there, mate? Um, uh, Hawthorne. Hawthorne for mine. Yeah, Hawthorne looked good uh, on occasion. So they looked like they ran out of steam uh, on the weekend. Adelaide Crows. Well, they were nowhere last uh, last season, so they've had a reasonably good year where they loomed. Uh, they were in the in the eight for a while, and then um, and then dropped their season dropped off a bit. Um, Adelaide struggled to win away from Adelaide. Is their problem? Yeah, they, well, that's some really had, that's had because some they've re- still got a pretty young list. I mean, yeah, Tex, had, Tex had Walker. some really good games away from Adelaide, but haven't managed to get across the line. I think lost. Well, I lost quite a few close ones. I think they're skipping but, you know, that's, the time. Everybody else had a pretty bad year, I reckon, apart from those few. Yeah. Uh, look, it's always one of those things. I mean, whoever wins the premiership is, you know, the, the, the side that loses on grand final day is said to be the absolute failures of the competition. They very rarely are. They've just, they've just had a, a bad day. I mean, Sydney had a shocker last year. Um uh, against the side that was just uh, blindingly good. And, of course, we, we, when we mentioned Geelong, they look like they need to go into a fairly savage rebuilding period, Jack. Mm, they do. All right, Rugby Union. Um, and, of course, we've got... Uh, Some sensational results over the weekend. Yeah, uh, help me the, out. The, 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 the French comfortably beat the Wallabies, but I haven't seen much of that But uh, from... Uh, all reports the Wallabies were actually not too bad, and the French are probably the French and the Irish are the best two, sides French, in the world. French, yeah. the Irish, and the South Africans are the three standout sides. Um, the uh, Fijians managed to roll England at Twickenham. Ooh, gee whiz, they'd be hell to pay there, wouldn't they? Yeah, so um, uh, Australia and England are in the easier part of the draw, at least we thought they were, uh, <laughs> to get through to our quarterfinals yeah. and semifinals. Um, but neither of them are going very well. England's probably going worse than Australia. Well, that's uh, that's uh, something else. Uh, in the NRL, of course, they have their final round this weekend and then their final starts. Um a, 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 a bit of a flurry whether the Cowboys, uh, whether the Cowboys or the Roosters can make it. Uh, have to res- have to have results go their way. Um, I did see Ricky Stewart. Ricky Stewart just continues to amuse me. Um, he's he's the biggest dummy spirit of a coach I've ever seen. He's re- if he ever gets beaten, he's just, it's just a horror show to interview. Uh, the Raiders uh, got rolled by. Uh, by the storm on the weekend, and there he was telling media to F off, Jack. I wouldn't use the word. Of course, I wouldn't want to offend anybody um, in a very, very, very angry mood. Broncos on top. Panthers uh, are now in second spot. They're the favourites to win it. Um, and uh, and the Cowboys and Roosters. The Roosters have had a funny old season where, it, you know, because their list looks good. They've had a few injuries, but their list looks good, but they haven't really performed all that well. Um, can and- you imagine being? Can you imagine being Mrs. Ricky Stewart? You know, if you served him a hard-boiled egg that was not quite soft enough <laughs> in the morning, um, uh, what sort of a reaction would you get? <laughs> well, we can go back. We can go back a little bit longer than that, mate. And I uh, went into a certain uh, pub in Wallara for a Friday afternoon refreshment, and there was Ricky, who was coaching the Roosters the following day, blind drunk, mate. Could not speak, um, and his uh, and his and his manager John Ford and pulled me aside. And said, "Don't tell anybody about this," and I've kept, I've kept my silence on that one for a long, long time. Yeah, and if that was so, in the uh, AFL, he would have been sacked. So, uh, uh, if John Fordham was there, I'm pretty sure I know which pub. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, a place where uh, a place where people often gather on a Friday afternoon. I, I gather uh, Ricky was coming off a long lunch and seriously had to be held up. He was yeah. that bloody drunk. 
Um, all right. Now, uh, <clears throat> well, look, we've, of course, we've had the world uh, world championships in track and field. On, I've been watching a fair bit of it, actually, some wonderful stuff there. Uh, and we have a new uh, world champion in uh, in the women's high jump jack. She's a Ukrainian. She, she's a Ukrainian, um, and she beat um, the two Aussies who finished on the same um, uh, level, but um, uh, a family friend, I must confess, Eleanor Patterson, uh, got the silver on a count back. Well done. And, um, and the other Aussie, uh, Ola Slager, um, uh, took the bronze. Oh. Um, so a pretty extraordinary performance to get two Aussies on the podium at a world championship. Yeah, I th- look, I think the medal tally for Australia was was I think I think one gold and and, uh, and and a couple of silver and a couple of bronze, and that puts us about tenth on the list. Um, mm. Some marvellous uh, medal distance running from the men's and women, and of course the the the, the East Africans all dominate that, and the Kenyans in particular. Um, and uh, yes, uh, uh, wonderful actually. Uh, SBS covered covered most of it most of the time it was good it's been great to watch and uh, and of course premier league jack have you had and the a big, look at the big new the big news is an aussie it's Ange postacoglu yeah um, uh, and he's off to a terrific start with spurs um, uh, a lot of people didn't want him to it's the same thing happened to celtic a early lot of days fans, early yeah, days we must say but they they're currently third on the table and and the fans love him i've got all these spurs mates um, who were a bit dubious about him getting the job, but they're big on Ange now, in in large part because he talks about the game in kind of basic common sense. They've had a lot of um, European and South American managers the last little bit, who, as a pal says to me, um, uh, talk about the game in a way that we can understand it, but you nuff nuffs can't, uh, whereas Ange uh, explains it. Um, uh, quite well and quite simply. And I think I sent you the video of this. He was called in um, uh, for a, um, one of those panel shows, a couple of commentators sitting around a couch, and he's running like this is a post-match one. So he walks under the set and uh, shakes the, uh, the 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 woman's hand and the guy's hand, and the uh, the, the soundies um, quickly ripping up um, Angie's shirt and and putting the uh, the microphone on and all that sort of stuff and. Everyone sort of sits down. Ange sits down, turns to the right to the Sony guy, says, mate, introduce yourself be first before you do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny. It was very funny in a post-match um, where the talk wasn't so much of soccer, but who did the duet with Kylie Minogue? And he, and he was saying, come on, you guys should know this. You guys just live in a bubble. You should know this. And he couldn't think of it. And then someone said, it was Nick Cave. And he goes, yes, that's right, it was Nick Cave. And then he he went on to talk about other uh, other singers that uh, Kylie Minogue had done duets with, and it was really like this is a breath of fresh air around a, a press yeah, conference. Yeah, well, um, I, certainly I think a lot last, better than a Ricky Stewart one. I, I, I tell you, what, last night um, I saw a video with um, uh, Robbie Williams, the uh, 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 US UK singer, singing a song about Ange Postecoglou, and at the end he says, "I'll have to turn into a Spurs." <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got the chant. They've got the chant. I forget how it goes now. Ange is something that uh, r- 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 vaguely, uh, uh, vaguely uh, rhymes with Ange. Um, so the the, the 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 Spurs fans are all happy for now. You know, it's a pretty <laughs> it's a pretty ruthless <laughs> competition in the very early days. It is, um, but. Uh, I think a lot of Australians who weren't quite sure who to bury for in the Premier League might be Spurs, Spurs fans now. Well, that, that, unless you've got something to take us out, mate, that will do yeah. us for the day. We, oh, gee, we went hard in the sport there. Um, I just sticking with the sport. Um, uh, I've been watching with interest the um, uh, implosion of the Spanish Football Federation just after winning the Women's World Cup. With oh, the, good lord! Yeah, with, with the with the president of the federation uh, in in a spot of bother because he grabbed the um, uh, the woman who I think she was the woman who kicked the winning goal, kissed her um, on the lips. Uh, yeah, kissed her on the lips after the thing. Uh, and and that wasn't if that wasn't bad enough. Um, and there was calls for him to resign. Then they put the put the arm on this woman and said, "You've got to agree to this statement." 
um, uh, yeah. that says that says that you consented to this happening and all that sort of stuff. And she quite sensibly said, oh, "No, no, thank you." <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and almost all of the management of the team. Um, have resigned, as have all 80, the leading 80 players who said they're not going to play. Wow. Um, but he's still refusing to resign. Oh, I thought he'd gone. I thought no, he'd gone. I thought no, they'd nailed he's, it. But, he, but he's been stood down by FIFA for oh, 90 I see. days. Oh, that's where I'm getting confused. Uh, while they investigate it. And I was just struck by this, just how on the nose do you have to be as a bloke to be too on the nose even for FIFA? <laughs> it's a new FIFA now, mate. It's yeah, new even, FIFA. But even with the it's new, new FIFA, FIFA, just 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 yeah, how bad a, just, in charge. And, just, um, just, how, just how bad a bloke do you have to be that FIFA can't even stand? You? <laughs> can't have you. Yeah, no, fair enough. Good point. Well, thank you very much, Jack. And just to follow up on what we were talking about before in regard to One Island and uh, and the book that I recommend, it's called Say Nothing. The author is Patrick Radden Keefe. He has written some magnificent books too. Um, but get hold of this one, and you might uh, have a feel have a have a feel that you want to read a, uh, uh, some more Patrick Radden Keefe. He's actually a Boston-based journalist, long-form writer. Uh, wonderful stuff. Say nothing is just um, well, it, it, it's just it's just a, it, it's just a, the tragedy of the troubles. It's just awful, and um, uh, and they and everything they tried to do just made it worse. Uh, all along the line, and he takes no position. He's, he's not a not necessarily a a, a Boston Irish Catholic, but um, uh, he takes no particular position. He just tells it straight straight down the line. Very very sad, but powerful story. Um, I want to thank you for your time today, Jack. Pleasure. And uh, and uh, as usual, we ask for uh, our, our uh, listeners to drop us a line if they feel so inclined. Uh, comments, criticisms, uh, you name it, we'll take them all. And uh, the best way to get hold of me is on my uh, Twitter DMs, uh, at Jack the Insider. And you can get hold of uh, Hong Kong Jack on his Substack. Give it to me, Jack. Yeah. HongKongJack.substack.com. I should almost know that by memory now, but uh, I don't. Uh, but there you go. Um, so thanks very much again, listeners, and we'll be back in touch with you next week. See ya. <laughs>